want to take this time and welcome you to another episode of Just Teach. If this is your first time visiting us, I want to extend a very heartfelt welcome to you. If you have any comments, questions, any prayer requests, the comment section is for you. And to everyone watching, we ask as always that you like this video, click that thumbs up button in the bottom left hand corner, and certainly share and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. All of these things go such a long way in helping us spread the message of the gospel all around the world. Now, we are continuing in the winter quarter of the International Sunday School lesson. Uh, we are moving quickly into the lesson. I do want to let you know, as always, that there are notes provided for this lesson. Uh, I do provide my notes that I use in this presentation. So there's a blue hyperlink in the description of this video, right under the description that says lesson notes. You can click and download the notes. They are absolutely free. They are my gift to you. I just pray that they are edification and encouragement to you as you continue to study the word of God. So the theme that we have been working with over this winter quarter for the international lessons is faith that pleases God. I, I have to be honest with you. I really do like this theme because faith that pleases God, as we've been saying, is faith, get this, that is placed in God. When you place your faith in God, then you are headed in the right direction in using faith that pleases God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse number six, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. If any man come to him, you must first believe that God is, and then that God is a rewarder of them that are diligent in seeking him. So that's what we have to do when we talk about faith that pleases God. First, believe that God is God, and then certainly believe that God is a rewarder. How many of y'all know that God honors faithfulness? Hallelujah. So if you put your faith in God and you have trust that he rewards the diligent, listen, you're on your way. Title of today's lesson is Faith in the Power of God. We, we've been dealing with several lessons of talking about faith and righteousness and, and, you know, faith and trust and all these different things. Now we are talking about placing our faith in the power of God, because the truth of the matter is there is a place where the power of man ends. And if you have faith in God, it is there where the power of God can begin. And make no mistake, we want the power of God in our lives and, and it's going to take the power of god in order for us to make it through some of the tests and trials that we experience in this life we are in lesson 10 we're going to be in the book of isaiah chapter number 40 we're going to look at verses 12 through 13 and then 25 through 31 this is a powerful passage of scripture if you are familiar with it particularly the last verse you already know where we're going with this but before we get there as always, let's do this. Let's establish a lesson context. Let's get an understanding, particularly of what's been going on historically at this time. So the first bullet point I have here is that Isaiah is the first of five books that are written by four different major prophets. So you've got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Limitations, Ezekiel, and Daniel, which are the five books of the major prophets. But of course, Jeremiah and Limitations were both written by Jeremiah. Often like to point out that the reason why they're called major is not necessarily because they're more important, not necessarily because they're more anointed. It's just simply because the books are bigger and we have more information. We have more details about that, about these particular prophets. So they are listed as major, maybe versus the 12 minor, which we have smaller books, less information. And then also, I guess for the fact that we have more information on them, it kind of lends to the fact that these major prophets are more quoted in the New Testament. If you download the next lesson notes, I've got information about the number of times that these prophets are quoted in the New Testament. And Isaiah alone is quoted some 67 times in the New Testament. So that's why it leads to drawing conclusions and categorizations like it is a major prophet. Bullet point number two says Isaiah prophesied during the time of Judah when Judah was spiritually compromised and things were extremely dismal. If you read in Isaiah chapter number one, verse number 15, God makes the expression that he's actually tired of people giving him offerings. 
He's saying there's no point in your offerings. There's no point in your spiritual, and I'm doing that in quotes because they really weren't spiritual, spiritual sacrifices. Why? Because there was no lifestyle backing up these sacrifices. There was no lifestyle backing up these offerings. And Isaiah 1 and 15, it says, and when ye spread forth your hands, he says, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make your prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood. And we know that, that one of the, the major pitfalls for Israel or even Israel and Judah in this context is idolatry. They, they, they were constantly picking up false gods, false idols, worshiping pagan gods, and sometimes trying to worship these pagan gods in addition to the true and living God. God wasn't having it. And God oftentimes would have to send words through prophecy. And then if that didn't work, sometimes he'd have to allow adversaries to come and subdue and overtake them in order to get Israel's attention. And we're going to get into some of that in just a moment. Please understand this. Isaiah chapter 40 is a continuation of what Isaiah was telling King Hezekiah in Isaiah chapter number 39, when he was telling them that a Babylonian was on its way that would carry Judah into captivity. Now let's go and let's talk about a little bit of Old Testament history so that we can understand what's going on here. Now I've presented this slide before, but let's, let's recap it really quickly. There were three United Kings of Israel. You had Saul, David, and Solomon. After Solomon, his son Rehoboam, uh, uh, split the kingdom in his arrogance and immaturity. And then and under a splitted kingdom, Rehoboam only had two tribes under his rule, which was Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. So the lower uh, kingdom, the tribe of the, the kingdom of Judah is the one that we're actually talking about here in the book of Isaiah. Of course, there were 10 tribes to the north that was ruled by a man by the name of Jeroboam. These divided kingdoms last all the way up until 586 BC, which was the last invasion of the Babylonians into the city, into the city of Jerusalem, into the to the kingdom of Judah that carried the last Jews into captivity. So if you see, I've got it earmarked here that Isaiah prophesied, Isaiah 40 is a prophecy that takes place during this time of the divided kingdoms, particularly to the, the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, to the king Hezekiah. Now let's look at this real quick. I got a, got a little bit of a timeline breakdown here. I want you to see, and maybe you can see this over here to the right where it says Hezekiah. And he served as king from 716 to 687 BC, and he was a good king. This good means that he started out good and that he ended good. He was, he was a righteous man, but nevertheless, the people of, of Judah weren't living right, and they were doing things that weren't pleasing God. Now, you can also see over here to the right where it says Israel into Assyrian captivity. That is the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom, by the time you make your way really into Hezekiah's reign, the northern kingdom has already been captured by the Assyrians, and the Assyrians are posing some level of threat to the southern kingdom. However, it would not be the Assyrians that would eventually conquer the southern kingdom it was in fact going to be the babylonians but you have isaiah who is prophesying during this time to judah to let them know that this captivity is coming he's prophesying some hundred years before the captivity in, even takes place and lets them know you have been dabbling in idolatry your ways are not pleasing god and god is getting ready to send punishment however even though he warned them of the punishment in chapter 39, here in chapter 40, he is giving him comfort. He is giving them consolation and letting them know, listen, God is a God of mercy and that this season of punishment is not without bounds. Understand this, the God that we serve, listen, he doesn't get any glory in us being chastised. He doesn't get, his, get any glory in, in, our, in our punishment. God ultimately wants his people to be as him, be holy as your father is holy. So understand that even for us as New Testament believers, we can take a page out of this and find encouragement and know that this sometimes things that we go through, it's just for a season. Second Corinthians 
chapter one, verse number four, it says, who comfort us in all our tribulation. That's what God is after. It says that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So understand this, God's ultimate goal is to provide us comfort and consolation so that we can in turn provide comfort and consolation to others that are in trouble. But for the moment, they're going to have to go through. So let's go back to the last bullet point here. I want to point out that God's majesty is emphasized. This is particularly through the book of Isaiah. It's his knowledge, creative power, and his uniqueness. It is, it is important for you to see God through all of this. I just, I just want to make that. I just want to hang that right there. It is important that you see God as God for who he is through all of this. So let's get started. Let's dive Let's dive into uh, verse number 12 of Isaiah 40. It says, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out the heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales in the heels and balance. Verse 13 says, who have directed the spirit of the Lord or being his counselor hath taught him. Now, wow, this, this should, this should sound poetic. This, this should sound like Isaiah is trying to paint a very colorful picture and specifically about God. Isaiah is trying to leave King Hezekiah in the people of Judah with a very clear understanding, listen, that there is no one and that there's nothing that can compare to God. He wants them to understand the preeminence of God, the omnipotence of God, the sovereignty of God. So he's painting God in a very majestic, that's the word that we used in, 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 the, in the first slide. He's painting God in a very majestic way because he wants them to see God as God. Listen, when we go through trying seasons in our lives, sometimes we think that the, the, the one thing that we that we need to know most is to not panic. You know, sometimes we think that we need to just have peace, be calm, don't worry, you know, and, and maybe try to figure out a plan. No, the, the one thing you need to remind yourself when you go through trials and tribulations is who God is. Remember God as God, because when you put God in focus, when you put your, your, your understanding of who God is in proper context, that will elevate your heart. It'll elevate your spirit and help you understand that greater is he that is on the inside of me than he that is within the world. That what gives us the strength and the breath to endure, because when we put God as God, then we allow the strength of God to begin to operate in our lives and make no mistake. Like I said in the beginning, we want to get to a place where our strength ends and the strength of God begins. You know, if you go back to the book of Job, Job gave us, <laughs> he gave us a, a very interesting illustration of this. If you, if you ever read the book of Job, you know that the first 37 chapters of the book of Job is Job getting a bunch of bad advice from his friends. It's them telling him the very wrong conclusions about his trials and tribulations and, and you know, and even leading Job at different times to complain and, and to not understand what he's going through. And then finally, in, in chapter number 38, after 37 chapters, God speaks up. And God broke his silence. And the first thing God did when he broke his silence is to remind Job who he is. He said, where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? He said, declare if thou has understanding. In other words, God was trying to tell Job, be between me and you, who's God here? He says, you don't, you don't even understand all this creation. I put all this together. And in, in, in this, uh, in the many ways, this is what we need to do when we go through trials. Remind ourselves who who is God exactly. 
God is the God of all creation. God has all power. God is omnipotent. He, he reigns upon the throne, but then also who is God? He's our loving savior. And through his loving kindness has he drawn it. He is our comforter. He is our friend. So reminding us of who God is, is so important. And that's what that's what Israel, well, Judah is going to have to do. That's what that's what the Jews are going to have to do. Because understand this, again, Isaiah is prophesying that they're getting ready to head into a captivity. It would be Jeremiah that would put a timestamp on that and let them know this captivity is going to last for 70 years. And, and that's enough time for a few generations to pass. And you're going you're gonna to come to a point over the course of this trial that you're going to think that God has forsaken you. You're going to come to a point where you think that all hope is lost. You're going to become desperate and destitute. And Isaiah is telling them in those moments, remind yourself of who God is. Remind yourself that he measured the, the waters in the hollow of his hand and, and meted out heaven in the span and measured uh, the, and weighed the mountains and scales. Understand this. What Isaiah is doing is what you might call poetic parallelism. Poetic parallelism. He, he's drawing lines between these different items in order to draw comparisons. So you got measured and meted out. M measured meaning again to give a portion to a rule to and meted out means to it means to regulate or again to estimate to 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 give balance to. So measure and meted out. And then he says the hollow of his hand and then a span. A, a span is is a man's hand from his thumb to an extended pinky and on average you're talking about an, a nine inch uh a nine inch distance and you've seen this before if you if you recall in uh first samuel chapter 17 where it talked about the height of goliath it said his height was six cubits and a span which would say that he was something like nine foot nine inches tall so a span is is a is a the width of a man's hand. So it, it it draws a parallel between mountains and hills, scales and balances. We're gonna read later on in some of the later verses where he's gonna say, "Sayest thou and speakest," and he's gonna compare Jacob and Israel. So here it is. He's saying, "Measured out the waters in the hollow of his hand. The waters of what? All of creation of the earth." That's showing you how big God is. God, you we used to sing that same song growing up. He, he's got the whole world in his hands. That's what this is saying. In the hollow of his hands, met it out heaven in the span. Comprehended. That word comprehend, it implies something like to hold or contain, to measure out uh, of a dry liquid measure. So when he says that he comprehend the dust of the earth, that means he measured the dust of the earth. It's a lot of dust. But God has the number of the of the the dust that's in the earth. He's got it. He's got that number in his head. He comprehended it. It says uh, that he measured. Uh, he said he weighed the mountains and scales in hills and balance. Who can do that but God? So then it says in verse thirteen. It says it says who hath directed the spirit of the Lord? Understand we read this word spirit. So oftentimes in scripture, it, it is the breath of God. It, it, is the, it is the wind of God. It is the attitude or the mind of God. It says, who have directed the spirit of God? In other words, they're saying, who has given God mental direction? Who, who has directed his understanding? Who has directed his thinking? Who has given counsel or taught God? Nobody has. God is omniscient. God knows all things. And if there's anything to be known, it came from God. All wisdom comes from God. Scripture says, if any man lacketh wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberty and upbraideth not. So Isaiah in these first two verses is trying to clearly establish God is the supreme ruler. And even though you're going through a challenging experience and you're going through a situation that might cause you to question who God is, he's trying to remind them, listen, don't forget about God. Verse number 25, he starts to turn some corners. He says, to whom then will ye liken me or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? This is, this is what God is saying about himself. Now, understand this. 
God has been likened to several things throughout scripture and these things that he has been likened to, um, it should move you to a place to where you have confidence and assurance in God. So one of the things, what has God been likened to? Well, we know most clearly in the 23rd Psalm, he's been likened to a shepherd. And understand that that if, if God is a shepherd, that means he nurtures and he cares for us. In John chapter 10, verse 10, he said, I am the good shepherd. And it says that the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So here it is. We should find comfort in God being likened to that of a shepherd. He's been likened to a rock, 2 Samuel 22 and 32, a shield and a sword. He is our defender, and then he is our weapon as well against the enemy. He is our fortress. We can find protection in him. The, the, the 91st Psalm, verse 1 he that dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So here it is. He is a fortress. He is our protection, winged creature, which leaves us with the clear understanding that God is greater and above all that we go through. So he's saying there's none like God. There's none equal to him. It says God is the Holy One. Holy means sacred. It means set apart. It means divine. And, and, and Isaiah, in prophesying this, by the time you've gotten to Isaiah 40, it means that he's already gone through Isaiah chapter number six. And make no mistake, when he had the vision of God's throne room and God train filling the temple and the six queen seraphim that were around the throne, what did he say in verse number three? It says, and one cried to another saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts who the whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth is a, is a demonstration of God's glory. God is the Holy One. Do, do, do you see what's going on here? This, to me, this is true prophecy because you've got a prophet that is speaking to people in their tribulation and he's not you know, telling them how much money they got coming in the mail. He's not telling them about a new car. He's not telling them, you know, about some crazy, you know, just future event in the future. No, the first thing this prophet is doing is he's reminding Judah of who God is. I am going to say this until I have no energy left. The purpose of prophecy is to point believers' hearts back to God. If people are thinking about anything other than God at the end of the prophecy, I wonder, is that really God speaking? Verse number 26, it says, lift up your eyes on high and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their hosts by number? He calleth them by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power no one failed. I want you to understand something. When it talks about this host by number, it's actually talking about uh, celestial bodies. It's talking about stars. He says he bringeth out their host by number. It's talking about the stars. And understand this, you know, star worship, which is uh, astrology, was prevalent. It was prevalent in biblical times. It's prevalent today. You got horoscopes and things like that. So, and I'm not talking about astronomy, I'm talking about astrology, which is which is when you look to the stars for, for worship and for divine inspiration and revelation. No, he, Isaiah is trying to say this thing that is so often worshiped and deified, he's saying God has control over that. God is the God of the thing that these pagan people worship. And, and it was very clear in the Mosaic law in Deuteronomy chapter number four, where they were instructed to not worship the stars. Why? Because it's God's creation. Why would you worship that which is created when you can worship the creator? So there's several places in scripture. We've got them listed out here. Actually, where different constellations, particularly our Orion, is actually mentioned in scripture. Job chapter nine, Job 38, Amos five. The, these are mentioned in scripture, but it's all under the dominion of God. Verse 27 says, why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest thou, O Israel? It says, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment passed over from my God. Again, this is Hebrew parallelism. 
So you say it's in speakers, and then it says Jacob in Israel. Now understand this. The northern kingdom of Gen, Israel, southern kingdom is Judah. So he's he's drawing a connection between the divided kingdom, but he's also drawing a connection, get this, to where how Jacob eventually, the, the, the Bible character Jacob, the, the, yeah, the, the son of Isaac, the Bible character Jacob made his way back to his father's land. If you recall back uh, in Genesis chapter number 31, after Jacob had had a fallout uh, with, with Laban, uh, uh, Laban, excuse me, he was instructed of the Lord to go back to his father's house. So it, in, in a sense, Israel is drawing, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah is drawing a parallel in saying that just as Jacob went back to his father's land, to, to, to the land that of his promise, He's letting Judah know you are going to eventually make your way back to your land of promise. After you go through this captivity, uh, and we know history is correct, and we know it's true, the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians, and under the, the rule of King Cyrus, uh, they were permitted to go back to Jerusalem and begin to rebuild the temple. They were permitted to go back and inhabit their, their land that they, that they were promised. So this is what he's speaking to. Uh, he's speaking to that historical event. So verse 28, it says, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, feigneth not. This is important language for the rest of this text. Feigneth not, neither is weary, there is no searching his understanding. He does not faint, he does not become weary. And there's no way that we can fully comprehend what God knows. Now, what does this word faint mean? Faint means to, to show fatigue. It means to exhaust yourself to the point that you no longer have energy. God never faints. God never fatigues. He never gets tired. And, and I know that people can read the story of creation and say, but God rested on the seventh day. That rest simply means that he ceased from working. It didn't mean that he was tired. It just means that God stopped from creating. So God doesn't faint. And then it also says he doesn't get weary. What is the word weary? To toil, to grow to be weary, to have pain, to suffer, you know, especially with effort to toil. So as to become weary and say, why then do I labor in vain? It, weary means that you have worked so hard to the point of frustration and you wonder, what's the point? What, 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 what good is it going to come of it? You, you start to lose hope. You start to lose faith a little bit. Isaiah is saying, God never becomes weary. And then he goes on to say that there's no searching his understanding. Understand this. Understanding is intelligence, insight. It's it's this word is used sometimes to speak of the understanding of man. But in this context, of course, we're speaking of the understanding of God. There is no searching the inside of God, the intelligence of God. The only thing that we can understand is what God gives us. The only thing we can understand about God is what God gives us. That's how powerful God is. Now, we just said that God does not faint nor becomes weary. So then Isaiah turns a corner in verse number 29 and says, he gives power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. So he's saying we give power, which is power that is conferred by God. I want you to understand that when he gives power to people that are fatigued, when he gives power to people that have been enduring a 70 year tribulation, when he gives power to people who were carried in captivity, who were likely fighting and battling and trying to remain a free people and now have lost, who have now been subdued, have now been captured. They are fainting. They are fatiguing. He's giving power to them. He's letting them know, listen, even though you are going through this tribulation, God is saying, I am going to give you power to make it through. That's how wonderful God is. Because sometimes we go through things in life and we wonder, is God with me in this? Is, is somehow have I done something to where God has turned his back on me? No, God gives power to the faint. And if you feel like 
you have reached the end of your ability. Listen, you are at a great place because at the end of your strength is where the strength of God begins. So then he says that and he moved, he says to them that have no might, he increases their strength. To those that are, that are weary and thinking that their labor in vain, he increases your strength. Power comes from God comes from God alone. Verse 30 says, even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. Isaiah is drawing a very clear observation that youth is often synonymous with strength. <laughs> youth is, is synonymous with vigor and natural endurance. And he's saying that even the people who have the greatest capacity to remain strong they will they will reach the end of their ability. The strongest of the strong will become faint and be weary. He says, and your young men shall utterly fall. Everybody is going to reach a place to where they need God. But what happens when you reach that place to where you need God? It says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. Listen, this is the conclusion of the matter. This is the this is the cornerstone of the lesson. This is the this is this is the revelation for your situation and what you're going through. What God has for you is He's telling you to wait. One of the most challenging things to do as a believer is to wait. One of the challenging things to do in, in, in our humanity is to wait because wait requires us to not know what's going on. It, it requires us to, to stand in a lack of understanding. It, it, it requires us to not know how and when, but when he says wait, waiting is a demonstrating demonstration of faith. We're talking about faith that pleases God, but we're also talking about placing our faith in the power of God when you wait. You are showing God that I'm not putting confidence in my strength, but I'm putting confidence in your strength. And it was Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, where he wrote, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. It says, my, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities and in my, in my test and my trials than the power that the power of Christ it may rest upon me. So in other words, he said, I'd rather glory in the fact that I go through so that I can wait on God so that I'm not operating in my power, but I'm operating in the power of the Lord. So what happens when we wait? I want you to understand one thing very clear about waiting as we're making our way to a close very quickly here. Waiting is not idleness. Can I say that? Waiting is is not idleness. Everything you're about to read right here, where it says they shall mount up with wings, they shall run, they shall walk. None of this says they shall stand around idle. None of this says that they should twiddle their thumbs. What, what am I saying? I'm saying while you're waiting, be working. My God. While you're waiting, be serving. While you're waiting, engage in devotion. While you're waiting, seek God. Waiting does not mean idleness. Waiting means that you're mounting up with wings as eagles, which means that God will elevate you above your situation. God will elevate you above your storm. Before God clears the storm, before God settles the matter, God will put you in position to where you can see your situation from his perspective. And you can realize, number one, that what you're going through, probably not as bad as what you think it is. But number two, you will realize that God is greater than your situation. God will give you peace in the midst of your situation so that no matter how long it takes for God to come in and move, you will be on the wings of eagles. Then he says, you will run and not be weary. What did we say about weariness? Weariness causes you to feel like all your effort is in vain. Listen, one of the most frustrating things to do is to be consistent when you are weary. One of the 
most difficult things to do is to wake up to a new day and try again and give it your best effort and give it your all because make no mistake, listen, faith, when you place your faith in God, faith is demonstrating your all. You will find God. You will search and you will find him after you have what? Searched with your whole heart. You've got to give it your all. So you're going to run and not be weary. God's going to give you renewed strength to where you're willing to try again. And then he says, finally, he says, they will walk and not faint. You're not going to lose power. You're not going to lose ability. You're not going to lose any natural resources. But God is going to make sure that you have everything that you need to be a success story. This is faith in the power of God. Faith in the power of God, it may look like a very challenging story. It, it, it may not be like those Disney Channel shows that are just all fairy and light. Uh-uh, no. You're going to climb some mountains. You're going to go through some valleys. You, you're going to get some cuts and bruises along the way. But what God promised you is that you will endure and that you will come out victorious. Listen, this is an amazing passage of scripture. I pray something was said along the way that can encourage your faith. Again, I do want to remind you that there is a prayer line in the description of this video. If by chance you came to the conclusion over the course of this video, maybe you want to give your life to the Lord. Maybe you have something that you're laying out before God. Maybe you find yourself in a season of trials and tribulations in your need of prayer, something that can strengthen you and give you strength to go through that, that weariness. Listen, that prayer line is available to you. Somebody's ready and waiting to, to, to bombard heaven with you on your behalf. Listen, and to everybody else, as always, we love you with the love of the Lord. We'll see you next time. Perhaps you'd like to be a financial support to Just Teach Ministries. There are two ways that you can give through Cash App at dollar sign C O D W C or through Super Thanks, which is located in the ribbon of buttons just below this video. And remember, any amount you give is greatly appreciated.